Hello everybody, welcome to Snyder's Inc. Today, we're going to be doing a Mr. Ball and Reaction. And this is Top 3 Places You Can't Go and People Who Went Anyways Part 22. Part 22 of this. Ladies and gentlemen, I need y'all to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. For both Mr. Ballin and for myself. They're getting right into it. You guys ready? Of course you're ready. Let's go. We're going to look at three places you can't go and people who went there anyways. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload three or four times every week. So if that's of interest to you, politely ask the like button to give you a ride home, but instead of sitting in the front seat, sit directly behind them and then proceed to violently kick the back of their seat the entire ride, periodically asking if you're there yet. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. On May 23, 2011, a 26-year-old woman named Jamie Miner was working at a fancy restaurant in Austin, Texas. That night, something seemed to come over Jamie, and she began acting erratic, according to her co-workers. So erratic, in fact, that her boss told her she had to go home. And so some- Hmm, so I wonder what caused the erratic behavior. Because they said she started acting so erratic that the boss said, you need to go home. Like, you're not meant to be. You can't be here. Like, what the heck caused someone to act that erratic so suddenly? Some of Jamie's co-workers decided they would call one of her friends to come pick her up because they were concerned Jamie could not get home under her own power. But it would later turn out that when that friend showed up at the restaurant to get Jamie, Jamie wasn't there. And so the friend tried calling Jamie and looking for Jamie, but she was nowhere to be found. When the next day Jamie had still not come home, Jamie's friends and family began calling around and asking if anybody knew where she was, but no one seemed to know. And so the parents filed a missing person report and then began putting up flyers all over Austin in hopes that someone would recognize her and call in with some information. But over the next several weeks after the police have launched their own search, no one came forward with any information about Jamie. Then on June 29th, so 37 days after Jamie has gone missing, a worker found some of Jamie's personal belongings inside of a parking garage about a half mile away from Jamie's restaurant. This discovery prompted police to pull the surveillance footage not only from the parking garage, but from neighboring businesses. And what they saw on all of this footage was on the night Jamie was supposed to be getting picked up by her friend, she instead shows up on camera trying to get in the side door of a steakhouse located right next to that parking garage. The steakhouse was called Perry's and Jamie used to work there. So Jamie tries the side door, it doesn't work. So she makes her way into the parking garage and tries a door on the back of the restaurant, but that also doesn't work. Then for reasons no one fully understands, Jamie made her way up to the third floor of this parking garage where she managed to pull off the cover to this huge air duct and then climbed inside. This air duct did eventually connect down to the steakhouse Perry's on the first floor, but in order to get down there, you would need to navigate these very tight and steep sections of pipe, and the inside of this air duct gets to be over 115 degrees Fahrenheit. The security footage only showed Jamie climbing into the duct. They didn't have footage of her leaving the duct. So the police made their way over to Perry's and this parking garage, and they get inside the air duct, and they find Jamie. She had managed to climb through the ducts from the third floor all the way down to the section of duct that was between the first floor and the second floor. There, she had tried to go down this very steep section of pipe, and after getting to the bottom of it, she could not make the tight turn through the pipe. Her body just could not contort around the turn. But unfortunately, going back up it was impossible. It was too steep, it was too narrow, and there's nothing to grab onto. Jamie almost certainly began screaming for help, but the section of pipe she got stuck in was located in a building just off of the parking garage that was more or less abandoned, and so no one would have heard her. It's unclear. Dang. So this girl went into an air duct that she really should not have gone into, absolutely should not have gone into. 
just to get inside the steakhouse for some bizarre reason. Unknown why she wanted to be get inside the steakhouse so goddamn badly. But she felt the need to get um, into the steakhouse. And out of nowhere, it got her stuck to such a point and she could not get out of the air duct. And where she would scream for help, no one would hear her at all. That is insane. That is a horrible way to have your life end, man. That's horrible. Clear how long Jamie was alive inside of that air duct, but eventually she died of hyperthermia or overheating. While no one knows for sure why Jamie acted the way she did on the night she went missing, it was determined in her toxicology report that she had LSD in her liver. LSD is a very powerful hallucinogenic. What? So she had taken LSD at some point during her workday and it had caused her to just act, act so erratic that she would do that? What? That's insane. How did she even get LSD in her system? During a busy 2009 weekend on a popular river in Florida, two boats collided. Within minutes, one of them, a 40 foot long pleasure craft, had sank. Luckily, all the passengers on both boats survived, but unluckily, where the sunk boat finally landed underwater was not very deep, and it was just barely outside of a main shipping channel, which meant if it didn't get moved, someone was eventually going to run into it. The marina owner contacted a local commercial diver and asked him if he would come out and lift this boat up and move it, but that diver was not gonna be available for several weeks, and he was asking for too much money. So the marina owner reached out to another local diver a guy by the name of Tim and offered him the job. Tim was not a commercial diver. He was a 43 year old recreational diver who was well known in the area and had lots of diving experience. But in terms of experience lifting 40 foot crafts off the bottom of the river, Tim had no experience. But Tim was excited at this challenge being presented to him. And so he accepted the deal and offered to- Wow, this guy, this guy has no experience lifting a ship, no experience on how to get it out, yet is still going to attempt to do it knowing how dangerous it is. Ooh, that's, uh, that's risky business right there do it for half the money the commercial diver was asking for. Even though Tim had never raised a boat before, he knew it was going to require a lot of lift bags around the boat. Lift bags are like these big durable balloons that you can inflate and deflate underwater. But before Tim could just go down and start placing these bags, he needed to do a survey dive where he just went down and checked out the wreckage, saw it for himself, and figured out how many lift bags he would need and where he would place them. So on September 12th, Tim threw all of his dive gear into his truck he left the marina and drove over to a parking lot that butted up against the shipping channel. Tim hopped out, leaving his gear in the truck. He walked down to the edge of the riverbank and he scanned out across the river looking for the buoy that the marina owner had told him was out there designating where the shipwreck was. Once he found it and saw that it was not very far from where he was, he just walked back up to his truck, grabbed his gear, came back down to the water's edge. He jocked up, then hopped in the water and swam out to the buoy. Once he was there, he placed his diver down flag on the buoy. This is a flag that signifies to anybody in the area that there is a diver below them, and then he made his descent. Tim didn't expect to be underwater for very long, and because he was a very experienced diver, he probably thought this dive was going to be extremely routine. And so for those reasons, he had elected not to bring a dive partner with him. This is a huge no-no in the diving community, especially if you're gonna be diving in a hazardous environment like a shipwreck. But Tim was confident, so he broke that rule. One of the pieces of gear that Tim had brought with him was a diver propulsion vehicle, or DPV for short. These DPVs come in all shapes and sizes, but what you should picture in your head is like a little torpedo with a propeller on the back, and the diver holds on to this torpedo and controls the speed using a throttle and basically just rockets around underwater. The current in the river that Tim was going to be in was fairly strong, and so Tim brought his DPV to help him stay near the shipwreck as he inspected it. After Tim went subsurface, he grabbed a scooter and began going straight down, and the water was not very clear, so he couldn't see the shipwreck at first. But after going down about 50 feet, he saw this beautiful boat. It was perched on its side on this fairly steep embankment with its nose pointing in the direction the current was flowing. Right away, Tim got to work swimming around the shipwreck, looking for different points on the
the boat where he could attach lift bags and marking those locations on his diver slate, which is like a dry erase board. But after going around the boat several times, Tim had not seen the actual impact site on the side of the boat that caused it to sink in the first place. And he wondered if it was hidden on the side of the boat that was laying in the sand. And so Tim decided he wanted to go down and have a look. And so he went down to where the- Well, this is stupid part. This is the, don't, don't care. You should not care where the impact site is. That won't bother, if that won't stop him from lifting up, don't worry about it. Just leave it be. The sand met the boat, but as soon as he got down there, he kicked up all the mud and the sand and it killed his visibility. And so he grabbed onto the side of the boat and he picked up his DPV and turned it on with the propellers pointed back towards where the mud and the sand was. And he kind of used the propellers of the DPV like a leaf blower and blew the mud and sand out of his field of vision. And it worked great, but he couldn't see the impact site. And so he got underneath the boat and got closer and closer to where the actual metal of the boat was pressing up against the sand and just continued continued to blow away the mud and sand to get a better look when all of a sudden the ship lurched forward and came to a stop on Tim's legs. He couldn't move, he was totally trapped. When Tim had used his DPV to clear away the mud and sand, he had also blown away some of the mud and sand that was keeping the boat from sliding farther down the embankment. And so when it got blown away, the boat became unsteady and it came to rest on top of Tim. When Tim was not able to pull his legs out from under this incredibly heavy boat, he most likely used the DPV to continue to erode the mud and sand around the boat to try to get it to continue to slide down off of his legs. But he wasn't able to do that because the boat was basically wedged up against his legs. Tim's legs were the thing keeping the boat from sliding any farther. And because Tim did not bring a dive partner, there was literally no one there to save him. And even though he had told the marina owner that he was going out to survey the wreck, he had not given his timeline, so no one was expecting him. And so he- Confidence killed this man. Confidence took this man's life. This man was so confident on anything he did that he just didn't think about dive partner or a timeline or telling anyone how long he was going to be or anything. He just knew because he was like, oh, I'm an expert diver. I've done this many a times. This will be easy. All confidence can come back to bite you in the ass. Never let confidence be the thing that controls you, your destiny. This guy paid the price. That's what I'll say. This guy paid the price for um, being as confident as he was. And now because of his need to see the impact site so badly, uh, it's going to cost him his life. He would have realized very quickly that there was virtually nothing he could do but wait to die. Several hours later, someone on the surface noticed Tim's diver down flag on that buoy and called in the authorities. When the fire department's dive team went down to the wreckage, they found Tim. He was still trapped underneath the boat. He had run out of air and he had drowned. From a young age, Carrie O'Connor had an intense love of learning. When she learned how to read, her parents had to bribe her to get her to put her book down so she would go outside and play with the other kids. While Carrie loved to learn about all things, her favorite subject was French culture. And so she began devouring all things French. And then in middle school, she began studying the language. And by high school, she was nearly fluent and taking college level French courses. Carrie would go on to earn several degrees in French, including a PhD. And in 2019, she put that PhD to use when she was offered a full-time professorship at Boston University. She eagerly accepted the role. After her first full year at BU, she decided it was time to get an apartment that was closer to campus. So in August of 2020, shortly after Carrie's 38th birthday, she, along with her two beloved cats, moved just 10 minutes away from Boston University into an old apartment building on a busy street. With her apartment still filled with unopened moving boxes and furniture wrapped in plastic, Carrie broke out 
Chatter laptop and enthusiastically wrote an email to all of her students for the year titled The Joy of Learning French. In it, her students saw her passion for the French language and how excited she was about the upcoming academic year. A few weeks later, on Monday, September 14th, Carrie was back at her apartment building after classes and she had just purchased a brand new piece of furniture that she wanted to haul up to her apartment. This piece of furniture was not actually assembled. All the parts and the directions were inside of this box that was seven feet tall, one foot wide, and weighed just under 80 pounds. And so Carrie got this huge box out of her car at street level and then hauled it all the way through the front doors of her apartment building into the first floor lobby where she leaned it up against the wall and then pressed the call button for the elevator. To understand what happens next, you need to have a basic understanding of how Carrie's elevator worked. Once the elevator car arrived on your floor, you would slide open this big door called the hoistway door. And on the other side, you would see the elevator car and on the car itself would be yet another door. This door is called the car gate. This metal accordion style door would also be slid to the side manually, but unlike the hoistway door, the car gate had to be shut all the way in order for the elevator to move between floors. So when the light dinged in the first floor lobby above Carrie's head, she opened up the hoistway door and then she reached inside and slid open the car gate and then she grabbed her package and began trying to push it inside of the elevator car. The only way it looked like she could fit this huge package inside of the elevator was if she got it in there at an angle standing up. But no matter how hard she pushed and pulled on it, she just could not get it to go inside. And so while Carrie's doing this, another tenant happened to walk in the front doors of the apartment building and they saw Carrie struggling. And at first he just walked past Carrie and started going up the stairs towards his own apartment, but he stopped and he turned and he just said to Carrie, hey, I don't think it's a good idea to keep doing what you're doing. That package looks like it's too heavy to be on that elevator. The elevator's really old and you might trip a sensor and it might start moving before you're ready. You know, we've had problems problems with that elevator before, it's just not worth the risk. And so Carrie, who's already pretty committed to doing this, she hesitates for a second and just kind of looks at her package. And she looks up at the guy and says, you know what, I'm just going to try one more time to get it inside the elevator. And so Carrie goes back to trying to get it on. And this other tenant hesitates for a second and then decides, okay, I'll help her do it. And so he goes down and he holds open the hoistway door with his hand and Carrie goes inside of the elevator car and she uses her hip to keep open the car gate. And the two of them begin pushing and pulling and finally they're able to wedge this package at an angle inside of the elevator car. And so Carrie thanks the guy and he says, no problem. He turns and walks up the stairs and he disappears. Once he was gone, Carrie didn't press any of the floor buttons. Instead, she tried to close the car gate over the top of her package. But at the same time, a maintenance worker in the floor below her, which was the basement, hit the call button for the elevator. Unbeknownst to Carrie, the top of her huge package, when they wedged it inside, had pressed up against the sensor at the top of the door frame that registers when the car gate has shut. And so when the maintenance worker pressed the call button, because that package was pressing on the sensor, it tricked the elevator into thinking the gate was shut and secured, and now it was time to move. And so the car began to go down, but it only made it a couple of feet before the movement caused the package to slip off of the sensor, causing the elevator to stop. Carrie was most likely very confused how this car would have moved considering the car gate was still wide open, but she had bigger problems. She was now trapped between the first floor lobby and the basement, but she didn't panic. Instead, she decided she would just get her package back inside the elevator car, and then she would figure out what to do next. The package, when it came off that sensor, had fallen forward and was basically jutting out of the elevator. So the top half of it was in the first floor lobby, propped up against the floor of the first floor lobby. And so Carrie turned around so her back was facing outside of the elevator and she got down in a squatting position underneath her package. So her shoulder was up against the package and then she began pressing it up as hard as she could until she managed to press the package back inside of the car. But again, the top of that package made contact with that sensor that registers whether that gate is shut. And so believing it was shut and secure, the elevator began moving down again and this time Carrie, whose back is to the opening of the elevator, she lost her balance and fell backwards out of the elevator into that narrow space between the outside of the elevator and the inside of the elevator shaft. Now, if the elevator had not been moving, she probably could have just crawled back up into the elevator, but unfortunately her package this time did not slip off the sensor. And so the elevator still believed the gate was shut and so it kept on moving down. And so as soon as Carrie fell into this narrow space, the movement of the elevator would have kind of sucked her 
her up into that space, crushing her up against the inside of the elevator shaft wall as the car forces its way down past her towards the basement. But the car doesn't even get to the basement. It stops once Carrie is pinned perfectly between the elevator and the elevator shaft walls. When the fire department finally arrived, it was too late. Carrie was already deceased. So that's going to do it, guys. Oh my god, that is dangerously scary. This girl had a package, just wanted to get in and it just had to be that her determination to put it in that goddamn elevator caused her life to come to a brutal, literally crushing end. That is scary as hell, man. I can't imagine that in the elevator, clearly. I'm gonna assume they probably made a new elevator after that. They got a new elevator because that that probably shows how dangerous it is. Man, I can't imagine the suffering that girl must have went through. I can't even freaking imagine. Ladies and gentlemen, that is it for this reaction video. I hope y'all enjoyed it. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Comment what you think down below. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see y'all for the next one.